Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, I have the light so I can't really see you, but I know you're there. So thanks for inviting me, uh, Nicolas. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so I think what I would like to do in this uh, talk is to give um, a bit of an overview of the things that we do in my lab, in my group, and also what was my journey into getting there and uh, what, what are the things I like to do in research. Uh, I will not give many details, I will just show you a bunch of different things and this will serve you as a, having an idea of what I do and then we can have a chance later today, tomorrow and during the school to, uh, to talk more and um, feel free to approach me and ask me for anything you want to know. Uh, yeah, so my name is, uh, is Lorenzo, I'm a senior lecturer in, at Queen Mary University in London and uh, so as uh, Nicolas was saying, I did my PhD in Italy. I'm Italian, in fact. Uh, and then I spent two years in, uh, in Tokyo uh, as a postdoc researcher. And then I uh, went back to Europe uh, in Portugal. And, um, and I always work with the humanoid robots uh, and especially with this idea of cognitive robotics that, uh, you know, robots can learn uh, similarly to the way to which we learn as, uh, as kids to, to do things. And, uh, and then more recently, I started my, uh, my work at uh, Queen Mary University in London. And uh, I don't know if you know about uh, Queen Mary University. It's not um, extremely famous uh, around the world. But is in fact quite highly ranked university. We are uh, we rank 100 in the world uh, within the best universities, and especially we are very focused on research. Uh, but uh, we have also very uh, kind of vibrant and international uh, student life. Uh, this is relatively typical in London because uh, everybody is in London from everywhere in the world. But especially in our university, we have a lot of uh, diversity in terms of uh, different nationality of uh, students. And uh, I really like to work in that environment. It's really inspiring. And especially something that we are proud of is that we are ranked first in the UK for so-called mobility rate, which means that students from low income, they come, they study, and then they can get a uh, better paid job, which is something that, you know, you feel like you're doing something good for uh, a number of people. And uh, yeah, at, at Queen Mary, I'm part of uh, ARQ, ARC, is the Advanced Robotics Center, which was established six years ago when I joined. And it's head by Professor Kaspar Altofer, who is, uh, uh, who is going to be actually the general chair of uh, ICRA conference this year. Uh, and if you know about robotics, you should know about ICRA conference because it's the main international conference of robotics. This year is going to be in London and chaired by Kaspar. And um, in this center, we, we do a number of things um, in the area of robotics. We build robots, uh, and especially robots made of soft materials, uh, like the octopus that you see there in the picture. Uh, and also, we, we make software for robots uh, and for different type of application, from healthcare to medical robotics uh, to assistive robots, service robotics, uh, robots for industry and also cognitive robotics and application of artificial intelligence into, into robotics, which is more uh, my area of interest. And within that center, I lead this team that is called CRISP, uh, which is Cognitive Robotics and Intelligent Systems for the People. I like the people to be there because it's a constant reminder of the fact that we do research to eventually do things that could improve our lives. And um, and the approach is that of cognitive robotics. And again, if you're here in this summer school uh, and also from yesterday, you, you're, you're getting an idea of what cognitive robotics is. But the main idea is that we can take inspiration from biological systems in general to build a better robot, a robot that can be more useful for us. But at the same time, we can understand more about human intelligence and animal intelligence. And, uh, and this is a snapshot of uh, the people in my team, mainly myself and uh, uh, PhD students. Uh, again, a bit from all over the world. We don't have a, uh, uh, that many people from uh, uh, South America, actually. We have uh, well, at least one person from Argentina. And that's it, I guess. Many of others are from, uh, from Asia and from, uh, uh, from Europe. 
So, but of course we welcome everybody, including people from Chile. So please come if you have a chance. And um, yeah, so, and um, okay, we are in a summer school of cognitive robotics. So maybe uh, we wanna try to say a bit more of what uh, cognition is, right? Uh, which is kind of elusive and very difficult to, uh, to describe, although it's in us, <laughs> but we don't really know maybe what to, how to describe it. And if you browse around the internet or books, uh, you, you may find a lot of different definitions that try to explain what cognition is. Uh, in a compact way, like in a sentence. And uh, for me, I try to keep uh, um, a very simple working definition, which is uh, cognition is what allows us to do the incredible things that we do every day. And in most cases, even without thinking, even without thinking much about what we are doing, we are able to do extraordinary things. And cognition is what allows us to do those sort of things. And it would be great to have similar capabilities in, in robots. And, um, and when I think about the uh, incredible things that, the amazing things that we do, um, you may be thinking about this sort of things, which in fact, they are amazing. Uh, it's, it's amazing that, you know, with training and with the uh, time, we can learn how to do uh, this kind of things. Well, some people can, maybe I cannot. Uh, I'm not sure about you. I'm not sure if there are uh, people in this room who are able to do this sort of things, but some people do. But even more uh, uh, astonishing is things like this one. And I don't want to uh, overguess, but I think many of you in this room are able to do these things. I typically can. If it's not too early in the morning, I, I manage. Uh, and the incredible thing is that we can do that in our own kitchen, but then we move to another kitchen somewhere we haven't seen before. We have to use a cup that we have never seen before. And we, well, we just do it, right? It's, it's easy for us. It's incredibly difficult for robots still, right? So, so I think this motivates a lot of the uh, research that we can do in this area and at least motivates the research that we are doing in my team. And in fact, Within this area of cognitive robotics, what we mainly focus on is what I call the, the intelligence of the hand. So anything smart that we do with the hands falls within the remit of the research that we do in, in my team. And this goes from uh, uh, manipulating objects, uh, but also using hands for, for communication. And, uh, you know, Italians, we, we use a lot of hands for communication. And, uh, this is just one example, but there are a lot uh, of intelligence things that we do with our hands, if you think about it. And so this is mainly the research that we do now in my team, uh, but uh, where I started from uh, during my PhD was to um, even look before uh, touching objects, how can we have a robot that will learn by itself how to reach for objects? So identifying objects around uh, using vision and then being able to move their limbs to touch them, for example. And again, um, if you think about babies, in the beginning, they don't really know what to do. They start moving, maybe a bit randomly, it seems, or with some initial motivation, and then gradually they learn how to, uh, how to perform movements. And this is exactly what this robot is doing. I was there showing a ball to the robot for several hours and several days, and only eventually after time, the robot learned how to uh, track the a ball with the eyes and with the head and eventually reach for it. Um, and, uh, and there are relationship, of course, with the talks you, you probably saw yesterday by Maria. She was already starting to explain this process of uh, robots that can learn uh, through experience. And then I, I moved to Japan and I had the chance to work with a bigger robot, a full humanoid. And so I was extending this work to the idea that the robot will learn how to uh, use the entire body to, to reach for objects. And again, in a process of learning and development uh, that was completely autonomous. And, uh, and later on, when I moved to Portugal, again, I extended this to then starting to uh, use objects and use uh, uh, tools as well. So in this video, you see a robot, uh, the iCup that you met yesterday, uh, virtually, um, playing with different objects and different tools, doing actions, observing what happens you see behind what what the robot sees through through the cameras 
and is building a relationship between uh, what uh, it does and what it sees, and then uh, it can make predictions. For example, we will see an object and uh, a choice of different tools is asked to pick the tool that is best in order to pull the object closer, and he realizes that the best tool is a tool that has a, uh, a shape that it's functional to the action that he wants to do, in this case, a tool that has a kind of hook-like shape. And interestingly, we tested the robot first with the objects that he was trained on, but then we tested with new objects, and in all cases, the robot is able to make some predictions and, uh, um, and guess what will be the best uh, object for the, for the case. So this is an example of what we call affordances, which is basically seeing the actions in the objects. So being able to predict when you see an object, what kind of action can you do? And this is again a capability that we have as, uh, as humans and we learn through experience. And uh, of course it could be very useful for robots. And if we further extend this, this was the outcome of a, a European project that we were working on with a team, very multidisciplinary team of uh, psychologists and uh, linguists and computer vision people, roboticists, etc. And we had this task in which we uh, asked the robot to make a sandwich and uh, the robot has to recognize the objects in terms of their names. So understanding that, oh, that's a tomato, so it can go in a sandwich, etc. But also for objects that he could not recognize the name, for example, that rake, he was able to understand um, the affordances. So able to understand, okay, if uh, the tomato is too far, I cannot reach it with my arm. Instead, I want to um, use a tool to help myself and uh, complete uh, the task. And, uh, and this was the outcome of, a, as I said, a big uh, European projects. In Europe, we sometimes have these collaborative projects between different universities, and I was involved in this while I was in, in Portugal. And, um, and yeah, if you think about it, this is uh, like going towards having a robot that could really go in a kitchen that he has never seen before and do some task that, uh, you know, with new objects and with new situations. Um, and of course, we were very proud of this uh, result uh, in terms of the uh, capabilities of the robots and the ability of the robot to reason and also react to some unexpected uh, situations. Uh, but to be honest, that was only uh, one successful video uh, that was not necessarily what happened all the time. And in some cases, there were still, uh, I would say, uh, relatively small problems that will sometimes turn into catastrophic um, consequences. And uh, so this was very hard sometimes to see the robot failing so miserably. But uh, on the other hand, it was, uh, again, a source of further motivation for us to work and to improve things. And, uh, and one thing I then started to focus in my later research was to really uh, improve um, some uh, motor capabilities of the robot uh, related to these simple actions, so picking things and moving things around, that uh, become extremely difficult when the environment is unstructured, when you don't know exactly where things are and how the environment is, is structured. And so, um, so in that sense, what motivated my later research, my uh, latest research at Queen Mary, is to look at uh, interactive perception and mainly the use of touch. To, to help this kind of uh, uh, actions. And uh, not only having robots that learn by themselves, but also having humans uh, collaborating in the process of so teaching robots. And this to achieve uh, eventually uh, adaptation and generalization, which is what we really need in robots, as I said. So the idea that the robot learns, but then is able to adapt what they learn to different situations and generalize to new contexts. Um, right, so after this kind of introduction, uh, I would like to uh, say a few things of the works that we, have doing, we are doing now in my team, and I will divide in these four areas. So starting with the tactile sensing. Uh, of course, the sense of touch is very important for us, and it's very complex, and we have the sense of touch thanks to different type of receptors that we have in our skin. 
And uh, what, uh, what I did uh, was to take, uh, I would say, mild inspiration from some of the receptors that we have and uh, building a tactile sensor based on um, magnets and soft materials. And I will explain uh, a bit more how do this, what is the main uh, sense in principle. The main sense in principle is that when you want to sense touch, basically what you want to do is that you want to estimate a physical deformation that happens in your skin. Right? That's what happens, that's what our receptors do. So in the case of an um, artificial sense of touch, we can have a soft material, for example, made of rubber or silicon. And as there is a contact with the environment, the soft material deforms, and we want to have some kind of measurement of this deformation. And the way we do it in this case is to embed some uh, magnets into the soft material. So when the soft material deforms, the magnet moves. And if we have a magnetic sensor that measures the magnetic field generated by the magnet, as the magnet moves, we can estimate that there was a deformation of the material that caused the magnet to move. And we created two different families of sensors that you see here. So the first one is uh, simply we have a small magnet immersed in a soft material, a rubber, imagine. And then we have a all effect sensor that can measure the three dimensional magnetic field generated by this magnet. So again, when the magnet moves, we are able to estimate the deformation. And in this sense, we can say that we can measure the normal force and also the shear forces in both directions because we can measure the three dimensional magnetic field change. So something that we did again in collaboration with the colleagues from Japan was to put several of these uh, small uh, sensors in, a, in fingertips. And then we can have a robot uh, uh, manipulating object delicately. So you see the robot uh, hand is now holding a plastic cup, which is very delicate, but still applying just the right amount of force so that it's not crushed. And also if the weight changes, it's able to uh, adapt to that. Uh, again, in a very gentle but robust way. And the second family of sensor is uh, inspired by this uh, uh, structure that we have in, also in our body, which is ciliary structure. Uh, so these are tiny pillars in which we embed the magnetic particles, actually ferromagnetic particles, iron and nickel, like a powder, and then we magnetize it so that it becomes magnetic. And then again, the principle is the same as this tiny pillar is deformed by a contact. We have a magnetic sensor uh, below that is able to measure this deformation. So we can say, you know, these sensors are in a sense biologically inspired because we get some ideas of what are the receptors from what are the receptors in our skin. But then we use a technology that is completely different. Of course, in our body, we don't have uh, tactile sensing through magnets, right? We take some inspiration from biology. So it's not necessarily mimicking everything, but taking some ideas. And uh, well, this particular type of sensor, it's uh, again, it's able to detect very small deformation. So we can use it for tactile scanning, for example. And in this case, we attach the sensor to a robot and we are scanning a surface where there are some apertures and we are able to tell exactly where they are and how big they are. And something even more interesting, when we, do this tactile scanning on fruits, and we're trying to detect whether the fruit is ripe or rotten based on the physical property of the cask, which changes a bit if the fruit is rotten. So we uh, swipe over uh, several fruits, we collect data, we train uh, classifiers, and then we were able to be quite accurate in telling whether new instances of fruits were ripe or rotten based on just a very uh, simple touch. which again tells another element of, um, let's say, mild biological inspiration, the fact that especially in uh, tactile sensing is never just sensing, is also movement, right? which typically we refer to as uh, uh, active perception or interactive perception, where perception is always doing something, doing some movement, some actions that is related to the property that you want to estimate and for touch, we have always direct experience of that. If you want to know whether something is hard or soft, you squeeze, right? So you have a sense of touch, but you also have the movement. If you want to know something about the texture, you uh, swipe over. 
Okay, and uh, well, I listed here a bunch of references. Uh, by the way, I will be happy to give the PDF of the slides later if you want to have materials, and so here you can know more about these sensors. Um, okay, and this is one component. Uh, then, where do we use tactile sensing? Where grasping and manipulation are, of course, two big areas where we can benefit from tactile sensing. And uh, what we did in terms of uh, grasping, uh, the idea is to use uh, vision and touch. And uh, we don't do a lot of research on vision, but we, uh, the idea is to uh, start from uh, uh, algorithms that are available for uh, vision-based grasping, which is, I would say, uh, is most of the research uh, currently in grasping is based on vision. Uh, so we take what is there and then we see how can we improve it by using touch. And um, so specifically, this was uh, brought forward by two students, Brees and Rodrigo. And um, Brees is actually the, the PhD student who likes the vision-based algorithms. So, and Rodrigo is the tactile person. So we had a bit of, you know, fight to see which, which one works better. Um, and uh, so what Brees was doing, uh, well, first of all, when you want to do, and if you are in robotics, so you either you know it or you will, discover it. Uh, if you want to run a lot of experiments with the robots, you need proper software to do it. Otherwise, there is no research, basically. We, we can't do much. And uh, what the Bris was doing was to develop um, a programming framework that will basically help to quickly design uh, robotic manipulation tasks and uh, run them and monitor them during execution. So this is, as you see, kind of a visual way of programming. Behind that, there is a uh, ROS and C++ and Python and all the things that you will need to know if you want to do robotics. But from the outside, it's a very simple connecting things and uh, just changing some parameters. And then, you know, you can execute things on the robot and monitor them in a simulator. And this allows you to quickly test different algorithms and, uh, and monitor them and see where there are problems. And in fact, what uh, Brice was doing then is, uh, was to take uh, four different vision-based uh, algorithms, two based on deep learning and two based on geometric uh, computer vision, and then run them and see what the outcomes in different situations are. And we see at least six different possible outcomes, which go from a complete miss of the object to being able to pick the object, but then if you shake it, it falls, uh, or you cannot put it exactly in the same position as before because it has moved in the gripper or a perfectly stable uh, grip. Right? So we were like comparing all these algorithm and see on the one hand what we can learn about the best algorithm that exists and that you can apply to your robot and how can we improve them with, with touch. And so if, a few things that we discover summarizing is that, um, so of course, uh, nowadays the, the Algorithms based on uh, on deep learning are very are very popular, right? And they claim to be the best that we can have. And in some cases they are, but the problem is that when they fail, they fail miserably. Uh, so uh, especially they fail, and it's no surprise if the um, deployment conditions, so the condition, the settings where we apply, are slightly different from the settings where they were trained. Right? And there's no surprise because if you have uh, because we try to have generalization, but this is not always easy. Uh, and especially with this algorithm that you may find uh, available um, on, on the internet, uh, GitHub, etc. Um, they may train with a lot of different objects, so they are robust to using different objects, but typically they will expect you to have uh, the camera and the robot in a certain relative position. If you change that, then you may have you may have problems. So in fact, what we saw is that uh, those algorithms based on deep learning they will fail miserably. So they will have a lot of those uh, complete miss. Basically, the object is there, they go there. While those algorithms based on simpler uh, geometrical computer vision, they will maybe uh, they will have more of the fails that uh, you know the object is picked but not. Uh, super well, so maybe they pick it and then it falls, but they have much less of the complete phase. 
And I think this is interesting because, so one aspect because this is interesting is that those deep learning algorithms are taught to be, uh, you know, we only use computer vision. So if it's a fail, it's a fail. I don't care whether I touch the object or not, because anyway, I can't do anything about it. It's like, a, um, you know, uh, it doesn't make any difference. If I fail because I touched the object and then uh, I was not able to pick it well, or if I fail because I went like three centimeters far, it doesn't make a difference. But in fact, if you think with a different mindset, uh, which is uh, the mindset that, oh, actually I can feel the touch, then it makes a difference if you are touching the object or if you are not touching the object at all. So, um, okay, so this is just a thought. Um, okay, so, and we learned these few things by running all these experiments. And then, uh, uh, yeah, how can we improve with, uh, with the touch? So one thing that we can do, of course, is that we can, uh, after we have picked an object, we can detect with touch if the object is leaping. So in those occasions where we pick the object, but maybe the grasp is not so robust. So if we shake the object, it falls. If, if we touch, we can detect that the object is leaping, then we can do something about it. And sleep detection is a big area of, uh, of interest in this. And this is a simple application of what we can do. Uh, so here we generate a grasp from vision, from depth sensing. We, we grasp and then from the tactile sensing, we detect that there is a slip. So the simplest thing we can do is that we put it back and we try to generate a better grasp or another grasp. And in this case, we, we see that we are lucky so we can, we can carry on with the task. Now, how can we detect the slip? Um, well, again, uh, one approach is that we can pick several objects and we can see the, uh, what are the tactile readings uh, during the motion of the object. And again, actions are important. So if uh, during training we pick several objects and we shake them, we excite a lot the tactile sensor and we can experience the different situations, sleep and no sleep. We can uh, collect data, we can label this data, and then we can learn classifiers. And in fact, what we showed is that we learned different classifiers, both for detecting the slip, but also for recognizing the object. And uh, the uh, accuracy varies a bit. So typically, if you know what is the object that you're grasping, then you are better at detecting the slip as well. And so ideally, if you could do both things together while you're picking something, detecting the slip, but also trying to understand what type of object you are handling, then this can help you. So as I said, another thing that we can do with touch is that before picking the object, if we touch the object, well, we can try to adjust the grasp to make sure that we have, let's say, the safest grasp that we can think of. And we did some experiment with this using a different system. In this case, we have a uh, dexterous hand with fingers and here we use very simple vision no deep learning just uh, simply detecting where the object is and then we move uh, around the object and then when we are there we start touching the object so we we try one grasp uh, and then we measure from the tactile sensor we with a, a metric of how good the grasp is based on the forces that we measure and then we say okay now let's try another one before we actually lift the object Let's try another one, try another one. And then again, we see what the result is, if it's more stable or partially stable. And we try different exploration strategies and uh, eventually we use this uh, unscented Bayesian optimization. I will not go into details of what that is, but it's a form of using a special way of Bayesian optimization to decide exactly where to touch. And we show that in this case, we can uh, maximize the number of stable grasps. So the approach here is a very simple vision, but using touch to complement that. Again, I'm skipping some details and uh, of course, feel free to ask questions later if you wanna know more details. Um, another thing that we can do when we explore objects, uh, and in this case, uh, uh, it's, uh, the objective is to explore objects to uh, estimate the shape and also knowing the shape, it can help you to better grasp objects and manipulate them. Uh, one thing we can do is make a number of assumptions. And this again is, uh, I would say, biologically inspired because 
um, our perception uh, or even our actions are always, we, we always start with some assumptions. We, we never start from scratch. We have some initial ideas, some initial hypotheses, and then we refine those hypotheses through sensing. And so uh, one assumption that I think it's very interesting when we want to uh, uh, estimate the shape of an object is to assume that the object might have a symmetry. Uh, by symmetry, I mean that there is a certain plane with respect to that plane, the object is symmetric in shape. And if you think about it, nearly all of the objects that you have around you, they are symmetric. So actually all of man-made object, artificial objects that are all symmetric with respect to at least one plane of symmetry. Even natural objects, they have, <coughs> oh, sorry. They have uh, at least some symmetry or some approximated symmetry. Um, and so uh, what we showed experimentally is that we had a robot exploring, in this case, uh, an object like a surface uh, by touch. And of course, if you, when you explore, the idea is to you try to reconstruct the shape, but you're also verifying uh, whether there is a symmetry and where this plane of symmetry is. And what we show experimentally is that if, the, if there, actually there is a symmetry, then we are much faster by using this strategy. If there is no symmetry, we are only uh, slightly uh, slower. But as I said, it's very unlikely not to be a symmetry. And again, uh, in terms of techniques here, we use a form of uh, uh, Gaussian processes regression that uh, it's uh, where the kernel is particularly tailored to assume this, uh, um, this symmetry. Okay, then we go to manipulation. I'm not sure how, how am I doing with time. Okay, what does it mean? How much more do I have? Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, all right. So we, when we go to manipulation, of course, um, well, manipulation is more difficult and uh, it, it could be interesting. And in fact, uh, student here, Gyokan, is uh, developing a strategy of uh, a learning by uh, demonstration where we have the robot holding an object and then the human demonstrates uh, a manipulation action and the goal will be then for the robot to be able to reproduce the action also with different objects and to be able to do that before the robot picks the object it does a local exploration by slightly moving the fingertips over the object to estimate specific properties of the new object such as the local shape curvature and the friction and if we do that, basically the robot can reuse the knowledge that was demonstrated by the human once and apply it to different objects. And we did this uh, with a few objects and a few examples, but of course, if you think further of the possible application, that will be kind of a golden uh, goal that, uh, you know, you teach, the, you teach a robot how to turn uh, bottle cup and then you can do it with all the possible bottles or maybe with the and a knob on the door and again um, what we do technically here is that uh, and again this is a combination of uh, using machine learning and in this case we use uh, um, dynamic movement primitives and we learn this through um, again uh, Gaussian uh, regression it is also how to set up the problems, uh, let's say, uh, so the, the work of the, let's say, the engineer inside uh, tries to set up the robotic problem to create a mathematical formulation that is good for learning. And in this case, what we, what we teach to the robot is not the trajectory, is not the movement of the fingers, because the movement of the fingers, they will change if you do things with another object. What we teach there is the intended movement of the object because that's what we want the robot to learn. We want to know the robot to learn the intended movement of the object. But at the same time, we, we assume that we know nothing about the object. We don't know the object shape. We don't know the object properties. So in fact, what we, what we teach is the coordination between the different fingertips. So the coordination between the position of the fingertips. 
So we create a virtual frame of reference that is, um, well, that is that frame of reference in between the fingers. And we, we create virtual springs that connect the fingers. And, and then the displacement of that frame of reference is what we record during our demonstration. So that's what the robot learns. It's kind of learning the uh, kind of coordinated dance between the uh, position of the fingers and the forces that connect the fingers as if they were springs. And then it is adapted to the new object by doing this local exploration that I, that I showed before. And in these examples, we had the, uh, the human teaching the robot by physically moving the object within the hand. Um, but in, a, in a more recent projects, we are actually um, using teleoperation to do that. So the idea is that um, a human will teleoperate the robot and will also receive the haptic feedback when the robot touches something, the fingers of the person vibrate. And again, the, the, the main objective is to do mainly pick and place, but in situations that are a bit complicated, such as this one, right? If you have a, a clutter of objects all close together, you have to develop some smart strategies in order to pick one. For example, you have to slightly move it and then create space around the object in order to pick it. And again, the way you move it around, it depends on the object, it depends on the situation, such as in this case, as you saw, the strategy was to put one finger on the on one of the uh, packages and slide it uh, on one side and then go around with the other fingers. Um, and so the kind of challenge idea is to have uh, this kind of framework in which we can teleoperate a robot in a situation and then the robot will uh, segment the different component of the action and learn uh, separate skills that can be reused as building blocks in new situations. For example, this skill of uh, sliding one object on a side and then uh, picking it uh, can be reused in another situation if, uh, if there is a similar type of clutter that is identified. Okay, so I spoke about uh, using the sense of touch to complement vision and uh, how this can help in uh, grasping and manipulation. And uh, just to recap, I gave examples. So in most of those examples, there is uh, uh, machine learning, there is learning from data, and there are uh, some, sometimes easy, sometimes slightly more complicated technique to make sure that the learning works well. But it's not just that, there is also design from engineering to design, uh, the, for example, the learning space what, which one to use, and some, some ideas uh, from uh, taking inspiration from humans or taking direct demonstration from humans to make things uh, better. So it's not just the AI or machine learning, it's also trying to get some ideas from, from humans possibly. Uh, now, slightly separate uh, topic is um, social interaction. As I said, we use the hands also to interact socially. And we have a couple of students uh, working on that, uh, specifically uh, HM and Tom. HM, she's working on uh, looking at how do we use our hands during a conversation, and specifically, how do we use our hand during verbal miscommunication? So let's say we are talking about something, and then we have a miscommunication. I say something you don't understand, uh, and we detect that sometimes in the speech signal because of these fluencies, you get something like, uh, oh, you remember uh, that guy I saw yesterday, like, what? what? So, um, no, I mean, something like this, right? So you stop, uh, you... So what we noticed is that in those instances, um, the hands of the speaker, they raise, they're raised. So we, in this experiment, we had the people sitting in front of each other and talking about things. In cases where we detected this um, miscommunication in the verbal signal, uh, we were tracking the hands and we saw that the hands were moving higher. Possibly kind of the speaker signaling that he needed more attention from point of view of the listener maybe, and so then the hands were raised. We don't know exactly why this happens, but we saw that this happens. 
And uh, other thing that we are looking at is how do we use our hands to better perceive uh, musical rhythms. So you may have experienced yourself that if you listen to music, if you listen to a musical rhythm, you, you may move your hands to try to understand the rhythm better, to synchronize with it and to understand it better. For example, by clapping or tapping your foot, uh, something like this, right? And this is something that we think, or is thought that your brain does this thing. So you feel the urge to move because your brain wants to understand better the rhythm. And so you start moving, you start creating actions. And uh, what Tom has done was to, is to create a computational model of it that tries to explain uh, exactly the processes that go on. And this is based on Bayesian inference and uh, Bayesian perception. Uh, and again, the idea is that uh, we start with an hypothesis of what the rhythm will be, and then we generate movements in a specific way to, uh, uh, to kind of match that rhythm. And I will not go into the details of this, but if you want to know more, uh, please ask me later. And um, another aspect of social interaction that we are investigating is uh, passing things. Uh, uh, from one person to each other. And, um, and this is uh, Zane working on it. And to study this, we have uh, created an object, a uh, cube, that has all those, uh, so those tactile sensors that I presented early on, we put many of these sensors around an object. And uh, with this type of objects, we can uh, look at the contact forces and the position of the fingers on the object when we pass an object. And so again, we, we try to describe a bit more in details how the forces are balanced between one agent and the other agent when we pass an object to somebody else. Okay, and that's, that's it for me. Hopefully it gave you an overview of the different things that we are investigating. And as I said, uh, feel free to get in touch later on today or also to drop me emails at any time. I will be happy to tell you more. Yes. En español también. Lorenzo, sí. <laughs> so, when you uh, talk about uh, manipulation, you show that the robot learned the different faces. Uh, when approaching an object, how does the robot uh, understand that uh, it is a different face? Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what we. So this is, as I said, a, is a large project where we are just starting. But uh, that's exactly the first part that we have uh, already looked at and uh, at the publication at the recent uh, ICDL conference. Uh, and um, so the idea is that uh, yeah, the human demonstrate uh, a com full action, right? And that will typically include the part of approaching the object, then grasping the object, then it might have some manipulation where you move objects around or maybe you rotate the object, then pick, then move around, then release all these different parts. And uh, there are many techniques that you can use to actually from that stream of data. So we, so we do this and we collect data, collect vision, we collect uh, motion, we collect tactile, and then you can use this data and, out and segment the different parts. There are many different ways to do it. What we are looking at, especially, is to use, at least what we try to do, is to use only the uh, motion and tactile part. And um, we tried a couple of different techniques to do uh, automatic segmentation. But the main idea is that uh, if you look at the motion and tactile signals, there will be substantial differences between different phases of the movement. For example, simple one 
If you are approaching the object, you have movement, but you have no contacts. If you are uh, grasping, picking an object, you have uh, somehow a constant, so you have an increase of force up to a certain level, and then you have kind of a constant forces when you, when you lift an object. If you are manipulating an object, you may have uh, intermittent contacts. You may have short contacts and then release and then again contacts. And again, this in relationship to the movement of the fingers. So if you have the manipulation, you may have more movement of the fingers. If you have a grasping, the fingers will not move much. And so we are trying to look at those kind of signatures in the signal to then automatically segment. And then after we segment, then we can use the data to learn different models. For example, I showed the learning of the in-end manipulation. So if we are able to segment the data only for the NM manipulation part, then we can use that bunch of data to learn a model specific for, manip for NM manipulation and then maybe another model for the picking and the dropping. Hi. Uh, English or Spanish first? Oh, yes. Bueno, eh, primero mi nombre es Ricardo. Eh, disculpa por no, llegué un poco tarde a esta parte de la charla. Mi consulta era más que nada en cómo, en de las menciones que tú agregaste en cuanto al agarre y al alcance de la mano, no me quedó en un momento que mencionaste eh, la distribución de pesos. La distribución de pesos, del, ah, ¿cómo la estimo? Eh, o sea, ¿En un objeto o como...? Eh, sí, de un objeto, porque eh, por lo menos en lo que alcancé a ver el video solo mostraban eh, objetos vací, eh, sólidos. Mi consulta, ¿qué podría ser para los objetos con líquidos o con sí, claro, gases? Claro. ¿Cómo sería la distribución? Porque no necesariamente el movimiento, eh, dependiendo de la cantidad de líquido que tenga el objeto, podrá mantener la misma forma. Sí, claro. Eh, o sea, creo que he entendido la pregunta que es, eh, bueno... Si tenemos un objeto que tiene una distribución de peso uniforme, es más sencillo, pero si la distribución de peso eh, muda durante el movimiento, es más complicado, ¿verdad? Sí, por sí. eso mi consulta era si hay una limitación en los objetos o en la distribución de peso se va a ver más adelante. Sí, sí. Eh, en uno de los vídeos que mostré inicialmente, no sé si lo viste, eh, había la, la mano con, con los dedos. Eh, agarrando un, un copo de plástico y después le mudamos el peso, o sea, le, le ponemos eh, agua dentro o algo así y, y con los sensores eh, podemos estimar eh, cómo muda el peso y entonces eh, también eh, mudar la, la fuerza del, del agarre. Y, y esto, pero esto sí es un caso también sencillo que es que la orientación de la, de, del vaso es la misma. Si al tiempo te mueves, eh, bueno, va a ser más complicado, pero igualmente por estos sensores que tenemos que, me, que meden la, la fuerza eh, normal y shear force también, idealmente tenemos suficiente información para, eh, para estimar cómo el peso muda en cuál dirección, también durante un movimiento, y adaptar el, el agarre a esos movimientos. Eso no son experimentos que hemos hecho, por, por verdad, pero idealmente sí se puede hacer. Okay. Y una segunda pregunta, perdón. Eh, en cuanto a, vi que el, más que nada la teleoperación era para poder hacer la demostración y poder enseñar a la mano a hacer el comportamiento correspondiente. Mi duda era más que nada en cuanto se afectaba, el, en cuanto a la fuerza que se podía aplicar en el objeto, dependiendo del tamaño de la mano, porque dependiendo del tamaño de la mano y del objeto, los alcances no solamente son con los dedos, sino con el resto de la palma. Eh, eh, no sé si he entendido bien la pregunta, pero era sobre el... Ah, ok. Eh, I can also ask in English if you want to. Uh, sí, no, pero creo que he entendido, o sea, eh, tú dices que la... En la teleoperación lo, lo hacemos con una mano, entonces cuando, cuando agarramos cosas con la mano, usamos el palmo también. Sí, que en cuanto a la teleoperación, es dependiente del tamaño de la persona haciendo la ejecución, ah, la, de cómo agarrar el objeto. Porque sí. si el objeto es muy grande para una, maño, una mano muy pequeña, 
no, es, no necesariamente va a tener el mismo agarre que alguien para una mano mucho sí, más grande. Sí, sí. Eh, bueno, la verdad es que eh, también en este tipo de, de operación hay muchas limitaciones. Y, pero esa es, es otra cosa interesante, que dependiente del tamaño de la mano de la persona, tal vez la, las estrategias que van a ser utilizadas pueden ser diferentes. Eh, pero creo que lo que es interesante es que por qué porque estás haciendo una teleoperación y al final la, la persona ve lo que, lo que acontece en el robot, idealmente la persona va a modificar sus acciones así que funcione en el robot. Y puede tener una estrategia diferente la persona, pero como que el objetivo es que funcione en el robot. Eh, y entonces la idea es que Cualquier sea la, la acción y la estrategia, es una que funciona en el robot. Okay. Pero eh, si el tamaño del robot cambiara, ¿no afectaría? Sí, claro. Ah. Sí, o sea, son estrategias que son dependientes del robot, ah. en este caso. Bueno, claro. Sí. Eso era. Pero, Muchas gracias.